So with reports, I always start at the clinical history because that's going to give context to the findings in the report we're about to read. I've highlighted this section for you on screen now. Now, the history is not extensive in this report, in all honesty. It says we've got facet OA, which is degenerative joint disease, and that the client has had low back pain for three years, so not loads to go on. I personally would have liked to have seen a bit more detail in the history so that all the information that we need is right there on one page. But this report isn't for me, remember. The clinician in charge of this client's case will no doubt have all of this information to hand already and be ready to cross-reference the history, the examination, the MRI in order to complete all the puzzle together. The MRI scanner used was a 1.5 Tesla, a 1.5 T, and these are very good quality machines. Sagittal is where the picture is taken from the side and you go through the body from the left to the right or right to left. Axial is where you take slices from top to bottom as if we're looking down through the top of the head into the body. And coronal is slicing or taking image slices from the front to the back. Impression of diffuse osteopenic change. Osteopenia is where we lose mineral content from the bone. Osteopenia is the mildest form then we have osteoporosis, and then the more severe osteomalacia. Postmenopausal women do tend to lose bone density faster, and this increases the risk of developing osteoporosis later in life. Interestingly, there's mild bilateral greater trochanter bursa edema. Now, there's no mention of the lateral hip pain in the history or any examination. Therefore, I would assume that the mild edema in the bursae is normal for the client, and is just an incidental finding that requires no further investigation or any treatment. Focal subchondral edematous change on the right femoral head. If you've watched our video on facet joints and degenerative joint disease, I'll put the link up in the top right corner there. You know that this type of change occurs when the articular cartilage or the joint surface has been compromised and synovial fluid infiltrates into the bone underneath the cartilage. Therefore, it's a sign that there's an element of degenerative joint disease in the femoroacetabular joint, which is the hip joint. Again, as there's no mention of hip pain in the clinical history and we have no physical examination findings, I would consider this to be an incidental finding until more information was given. No sacroiliitis change. Sacroiliitis changes are more commonly abnormal signal in the articular cartilage and erosions of the SI joint. So we'll assume that these are not evident. No paravertebral collections. We're ruling out any evidence of abscesses, cysts, etc. Makes the likelihood of infection very unlikely. Spinal curvature with lumbar convexity to the right. This can also be called a dextroscoliosis, which is strange enough, a form of scoliosis. The degree of this scoliosis was explained in a separate x-ray report supplied by the client. It was a 12 degree curve, which is considered to be a mild scoliosis. Just to give you context, anything below 10 degrees doesn't warrant being diagnosed as a scoliosis. A scoliosis that curves to the left is called a levoscoliosis. So curvature to the right is a dextroscoliosis. No vertebral edema. Edema in the vertebral body can be associated with some malignancies or cancers. Therefore, we could move the likelihood that the pain is caused by cancer way down our list of differential diagnoses. Slight retrolisthesis of L3 on L4 vertebral body. We'll see this by looking at the spine from the sides, the sagittal view. The smooth curve will be interrupted by the L3 vertebral body sitting back and narrowing the neural foramina that the spinal nerve would pass through. The cause of this could be genetic and could have been there from the day they were born. It could also have been caused by an arthritic or degenerative change, and that's most likely in this case because in the x-ray report again, they do describe it as a degenerative retrolisthesis. The opposite of a retrolisthesis is an anterolisthesis, and these are considered to be more serious due to the fact that you have to have a structural defect in the pars interarticularis that allows the spine to shift forwards under the force of gravity. The degree of retrolisthesis can vary. In our case, the x-ray report mentioned that it's a grade one. So that fits together nicely with the fact that it's a mild retrolisthesis. Moving on to the second page, and we've got a breakdown of each specific level of the lumbar spine. L2, L3, 
there's fluid within the facet joints or a fusion. And this can be a sign of facet joint instability due to a degenerative spondylolisthesis, which would make sense as we know that there is a retrolisthesis present. We have ligamentum flavum thickening. Uh, the ligamentum flavum is a springy elastin sort of ligament that as we age gets less springy and can start to encroach into the spinal canal and in some cases can cause compression to the nerves. Circumferential disc bulge. The posterior body of the disc bulges and compresses the epidural veins. I've put an illustration of this on the screen for you to compare a normal disc, if there is such a thing, and a circumferential bulging one as well. Central spinal canal and neuroforamina. I said foramina. Well, the spinal canal and the neuroforamina are capacious. Capacious means having a lot of space inside or roomy. Therefore, I think we can assume that's the opposite of compression, so that's a good thing. L3, L4, we have slight retrolisthesis of L3 on L4 vertebral body. Uh, we talked about that earlier. And again, we have bilateral facet joint effusions and ligamentum flavum thickening. And circumferential disc bulge with abutment, so the disc is pushing up against the anterior thecal sac. Now, does this have any clinical significance? Well, to be honest, as I may have mentioned earlier, we're not sure due to the lack of clinical history and the absence of any physical examination findings in order to put these findings into any kind of context. The central spinal canal narrowing with the AP diameter measuring 9.9 millimeters. AP means anterior to posterior, basically front to back. So 9.9 millimeters is the width of the spinal canal where the spinal cord travels through from the front of the spinal canal to the back. Normal is 15 millimeters, but it can be up to double that in some people. However, anything less than 10 millimeters is considered stenotic and could well be the primary source of that person's symptoms. We also have discogenic abutment of the L4 spinal nerve roots within the left and right lateral recess. Again, we want to match these structural changes with information in the clinical history and the physical examination process. Does this person have any leg pain? Do they have loss or change of sensation over the L4 nerve root dermatome? Do they have evidence of foot drop, which is a weakness of the tibialis anterior muscle that makes people walk, well, a bit like this up on screen here? Is it bilateral? both sides because the abutment is bilateral. So if none of these symptoms are present and sensation reflexes and muscle strength tests are all negative, then we most likely have another incidental finding here on the MRI exam. And without repeating myself too often, which I know I've done already, this is why history and examination are so, so important. At level L4, L5, we've got bilateral facet joint effusions and mild ligamentum flavum thickening just as we have in the levels above. We also have a mild broad base posterior disc bulge with abutment of the thecal sac. Again as with the segment above there's pressure on this thecal sac and that could potentially cause problems or it could be another incidental finding. And we've got a nice capacious central spinal canal and neural foramina <laughs> where the left and right spinal nerves start their journey. L5-S1, we have bilateral facet joint degenerative change. No surprises there really because degenerative changes quite often happen in these weight-bearing joints, even in asymptomatic people. We have to respect though, in the clinical history, we have a long history of low back pain. We do have that in the history and this facet degeneration could be part of the person's symptoms. The ligamentum flavum at this level shows no sign of thickening and we have a very subtle broad-based posterior disc bulge. Therefore, that's most likely incidental again, but we must check the history and examination to make sure we don't all assume. And there was no sign of any narrowing in the spinal canal or in the neuroforamina again. That's the findings section done. So let's go back up and have a look at the opinion section at the top of the first page. Listed here are usually the most relevant findings from the MRI scan. Multi-level bilateral facet joint arthrosis is mentioned, and they also mention the slight retrolisthesis of L3 on L4, and probably the most clinically relevant finding, in my opinion anyway, 
is the central spinal canal narrowing, which measured 9.9 millimeters at that specific level. There is some discogenic abutment at that L4 level. However, with no information on whether there's any neurological symptoms at the L4 spinal nerve level uh, in either the clinical history, and we don't have any physical examination findings, we cannot be certain. I'd personally be interested to know if, along with having pain in the low back, if they also experience pain into the buttocks, legs or feet. Is there any evidence of foot drop, any loss or change of sensation in the legs or feet? And whether they struggle to walk downhill, but are better walking uphill. If you'd like me to talk through any more reports or talk through your report like this, then please put a yes in the comments below and maybe even add your report in the comments with all your names, dates of birth and any addresses removed from the public view, please. But we'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.